All right, let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about uh, proximal Newton methods. And um, this essentially is a, we talked about proximal gradient methods already in the class, right? So which was a, a way of kind of uh, optimizing non-smooth functions, at least simple non-smooth functions, with a thing that looked you know, like gradient descent, but had this extra prox operator involved, and ended up inheriting a lot of the nice properties of gradient descent, like linear convergence and stuff, despite the fact that it had this non-smooth term, um, even though you could also, you could also uh, despite that it has a non-smooth term, as long as you could solve this prox operator. And today we're going to talk about, about the, the Newton, ver the natural question for that is, well, is there a, a second order equivalent to this? And there is, and it's called the proximal Newton method, um, but it does have some caveats, and we'll get into all that uh, in a little bit. Before we start, though, I just want to give a brief recap of last time. That was uh, quasi-Newton methods. And we actually, these actually will come up again, um, this time, very, very briefly, just in terms of uh, quasi, uh, proximal quasi-Newton methods. So everything we're talking about today in the Newton case uh, and the proximal Newton case can also be extended to the quasi-Newton case. So you can develop, you know, uh, you, you can have that similar kind of super linear convergence without the n squared cost uh, for pr proximal Newton methods as well. Though, again, there is this caveat that I'll get to about quasi-Newton methods uh, in a second. Um, but remember, quasi-Newton methods were about optimizing a unconstrained uh, twice differentiable function. And the idea here was that although we didn't want to do the full Newton method, uh, with the actual you know, inverse of the Hessian, we formed some approximate Hessian, or really approximate inverse of the Hessian, that we called either B for the approximate Hessian, or B or C for the approximate inverse of the Hessian, and we would do our updates uh, like this. And the key part about the different quasi-Newton algorithms was how they actually um, performed the update of this, or computed and performed the update of this B or C matrix. So for example, SR1, um, did a rank one update for the Hessian. BFGS, which actually introduced first, did, did a rank two update of the Hessian. DFP is a rank two update of the inverse Hessian. And then LBFGS was a limited memory version of BFGS. Um, so today, though, we're going to talk about proximal Newton methods. And uh, for, actually, first of all, first of all, are there any questions from last time? I can actually ask that, because I taught it last time, too. OK. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, proximal Newton methods. And at a very high level here, I kind of want to sketch out the, sort of the landscape we've been talking about, um, about optimization as a whole. So in terms of the methods, there's you know, first order methods here and second order methods. So this is, this is gradient descent and second order. So this is you know, canonically Newton's method. Oh, my goodness, this is zoomed in way too much. There we go. I don't know why it zooms in at all. I don't know why you'd want it zoomed in. <laughs> Second order methods. And so for sort of, you know, unconstrained smooth functions here, um, this is just gradient descent, right? We just have normal gradient descent for our first order optimization method for unconstrained smooth optimization. And that gets linear convergence. That's, that's nice. Uh, our, our sort of canonical second order method here was, uh, was Newton's method. Uh, and then kind of in between here, we had quasi-Newton methods, right? Uh, quasi-Newton. All right. Um, this sort of matrix here. So then, on the other hand, if our, um, our function class was, was um, non-smooth or constrained, but kind of simple, and by simple I mean here has an efficient prox operator, or an efficient projection operator, equivalently, because the prox is a generalization of the projection. So this is going to be um, uh, non-smooth, I'll just sort of call it like non-smooth simple here. Uh, i.e. with a prox. Then we have um, proximal gradient. Right. Um, and sort of the, the last, and, and then we don't really know what this thing is here. We'll talk about this here today. Uh, and then sort of non-smooth, 
I guess I'll just call it complex here, not like imaginary complex, just like hard general. I should probably call it like general. Though again, general is in quotes because you still have to phrase it in terms of like a Cohen program or something like that to really solve these things. Um, here we have interior point methods, right? They can solve with a second order method. They solve general uh, constrained problems. Um, in the first order category, we, we kind of have, uh, I, I guess you could say we have like uh, subgradient descent. So subgradient descent you can technically apply here, um, but with a big caveat that it doesn't actually convert, you know, not fast conversions. In other words, you will not, you'll get sub, you know, or you, you, have to, you get sublinear conversions. So you, so you don't expect to really get an accurate solution to numerical precision. Um, and then today we're going to kind of talk about, uh, and then I guess here there's some stuff too, but I don't think, I don't know if we get to those in this class. Um, and then today we're going to talk about kind of this region here. So what can you do with the second order method if you have a non-smooth but kind of simple function, right? So like you know, maybe an L1 penalty on some, on some you know, general loss that you want, you want to optimize, but you want to be able to do it kind of exploiting maybe the structure of that, of that, something like the prox operator. OK, so this, this is the topic of today. Any questions on that? Is, that, is this in focus, by the way? Is this, I feel like the focus is not quite right here. Uh, that's brightness. That's not what I want. Uh, well, might have to just be life. OK. Autofocus, is that right? Autofocusing. There, that's better. OK. So this, this is sort of the outline of the problems we can solve. And this is what we're going to talk about today. So let's first recap um, proximal gradient descent. And the idea here um, is that we want to solve some problem uh, minimizing g of x plus hx, where um, g is assumed to be convex and smooth. So it's you know, a general kind of convex function, but a smooth one. Uh, but h is convex and kind of, is, it's not necessarily smooth, but it's kind of simple. So one of the common examples that's brought up is the, uh, the L1 norm. So it's not a smooth function, but it's simple in a way. Um, and the update here is very simple. We just repeatedly solve the update. Um, x k is equal to the prox. And he says sort of prox t here, which is some step size, um, uh, where the step size manifests here in the prox operator. He says prox t, I'm sorry, xk plus 1 equals the prox of xk minus uh, t times the great tk times the gradient of the g of xk. I guess he wrote it there with indices <laughs> xk. I wrote it with xk plus 1, but uh, same thing. Um, so we just repeat this update. And this is kind of like a gradient update we saw. Uh, but it involves this additional prox operator, right? If, if, if it was just this thing, it would be a normal gradient update, we had this additional prox operator there. And the prox operator solves a, another optimization problem. So it sounds like we're kind of you know, creating more work for ourselves. Uh, the prox operator of. Uh, of x is equal to the argmin over z of 1 over 2t x minus z. So you're finding the, you know, the closest z to x while also uh, minimizing some other function, this other non-smooth function, h of, oops, h of z. And that's the, that's the prox operator. And the whole point of the prox operator, in some sense, is that this is, is very nice because our outer iteration here, our sort of main prox step, it, it, it inherits all the nice properties like linear convergence and such of gradient descent. Um, but of course, being able to implement it efficiently requires that we solve this problem. So it's only really applicable in the cases where this problem is solvable in a nice closed form. Um, and so some, there, are, there are some examples of this, though. Like, for instance, um, if h is the L1 norm, you can actually solve this as a very simple analytical form in terms of soft thresholding the values in, in, uh, in x. 
Right? So if you can do it, this is a very nice thing because it allows you to incorporate uh, these constraints that, you know, if you solved it with subgradient descent, the original problem, you wouldn't get nearly as fast convergence. Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's, it lets you get the nice properties of gradient descent um, as, long as, as long as you're able to um, solve this prox operator well. So that's nice. Um, the other thing that we want to sort of point out here, I'll just sort of say this, is that uh, if you just expand these definitions here, what you see is that the proximal gradient descent is, is sort of doing something like iteratively minimizing a quadratic approximation of, of uh, the function, uh, in this case, g, um, plus the original h, where you assume, though, so, so you know, it's sort of like minimizing, I guess he says, he says x, x plus uh, is the argument of something like a quadratic approximation of uh, around around of, of g here. So it's the gradient of g x transpose z minus x plus, um, I'll just write it like this actually, uh, well, yeah, 1 over 2t x minus z squared plus h of z. So something like a quadratic approximation, you can think of this term as like a quadratic approximation to g, but essentially with the, with, with, with the Hessian approximation being you know, equal to basically 1 over 2t times the identity, which is, um, sorry, just 1 over t times the identity. The 2 is always the factor there in, in, in quadratic terms. So um, you know, it seems like a reasonable approximation, but it isn't a good approximation because we're using just the identity as the approximation to our Hessian, which is not necessarily going to be very good. Um, whereas Newton's method, when you think of it in the same way, it would, it, it would minimize a, uh, you know, the, the quadratic approximation here with the true Hessian uh, in place of this identity. So the question, of course, sort of is, um, what happens if we replace this uh, 1 over t times i with the actual Hessian and try to apply a proximal, a proximal, operator, a proximal method? So what this is going to lead us to is the proximal Newton method. So I'm going to write it like this. So, so first of all, I should write this a little differently. I'm going to write this. this just notice this, this operator here is equivalent to um, the argmin over v. v here is really uh, z minus x of, um, actually, which, which way did he have it in the previous one? Did he have, yeah, OK. Uh, the gradient with respect to x of g, uh, g of x transpose v um, plus 1 over 2t norm of v squared plus h uh, x plus v. So v is like our, our additional term here. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to note that you can write it like this to the original proximal gradient descent. And we're going to write the, the Newton version in the same way. So this is sort of you know proximal gradient. What we're going to do is we're just going to write the same thing, but replacing this term here with the actual Hessian. So we would instead would like to have the update. Um, I'll just write it in terms of sort of uh, uh, our update. So, so v, uh, let's see, I guess v, <laughs> vk equals the argmin over v uh, gradient to x. I'll omit the subscript. No, I'll just write it the way he does it in the slides, actually. Uh, gradient this times transpose v plus, instead of this term, we're just going to place the actual Hessian there. So v transpose h uh, k minus 1 v, and then plus h x k minus 1 plus v. OK, and then we're actually going to update x uh, to be xk minus 1 plus some step size t times vk. Okay, so we're just doing the same thing with proximal gradient here, um, uh, just doing it in this, just, just replacing the identity here with the Hessian. Right. So the question is sort of what does this do? What is this method here? Um, I should just mention you can also, <laughs> sort of in lots of different ways, you can, you can also write this in terms of, uh, in sort of the, the um, 
the ZK form. So you can write it in this form or in this form. And he just has both of those now in the slides. So it's either this form or this form. But both these things, both these two things work. Okay. So this here, um, I guess I'm just like this. So this, these two things, uh, let's be clear. This is proximal gradient. And this is proximal Newton. Uh, where here, uh, h k minus 1 is just equal to the, the Hessian, importantly, of the smooth component of uh, our function we're minimizing. So just the Hessian of g. I guess I evaluated it x k minus 1. There we go. <laughs> Get all those sub, uh, superscripts in the correct place. So the question is, you know, what does this actually do? How does this work? Um, and sort of, is it a practical algorithm or not? And the answer actually is a little bit tricky here. Um, because it, it does work. And so if, if you're able to do this, as you would expect, you get all the nice properties of Newton's methods. So you get quadratic conversions, all those kind of things, um, even though you have a non-smooth part of your function. So that's great. Uh, but unlike the proximal gradient case, solving this problem here, this argmin, can be actually quite hard in a lot of cases. Uh, it doesn't have a simple form like you often find for um, the, the, the proximal gradient term. And so actually solving this can be rather, rather difficult. So uh, this method, I should have, as, as a whole, can be actually very efficient. It can be state of the art for a lot of problems. But that requires a special method for solving this inner, this inner argument here. And if you have that, then you can do well. But it's, it's not nearly as often as it is in, say, prox gradient that you have this method. All right. Um, so again, just some notation here. This term here is called the, the, the scaled proximal map. So whereas the proximal map was just the, the function you know, with, with the, essentially with the identity uh, here, scaling it, uh, we can define also a scaled proximal map that basically has the, instead of you know, going from um, prox t of x, so I'm going to write it again just to, to have them both, prox t of x being um, the argmin over z of 1 over 2t x minus z squared plus h of z. Um, prox h of x, which is a strict generalization of this, is equal to the argmin over z of 1 half um, x minus z in the h norm squared plus h of z, where uh, the h norm of a vector x is just equal to x, just defined as being x transpose hx. So it's just the quadratic form with that inner, with that inner matrix. And this is called the scale proximal map. And of course, if we just you know, plug in 1 over t times i, we get back the original uh, proximal operator. But this will be this will be how we do it. Uh, know there's a little bit difference in terms of you know you 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 usually define the um, this thing with a one over t term here where this just has the the h term there, but that's just notation. Um, and so of course you know our our prox update which we have here, our prox Newton update can also be written in terms of the the proximal map, right? Because our you know z here, which is the minimum of this quadratic term, plus that other term, uh, can also be written as, as the, in terms of the h norm of this thing. So in other words, I think that's the next slide, um, the prox Newton method can also be written as you know, zk being equal to the prox, the scaled prox map for the k minus 1 uh, value of the Hessian of x k minus 1. Uh, minus this term h k minus 1 inverse times the gradient g of x k minus 1. And then we do our, our update as before. Uh, then x k equals x k minus 1 plus t k of our previous thing of c k minus x. Okay, so we can also write our prox Newton this way, 
in terms of the scaled proximal map. And, and the high level here really, at, at, at some level, is just uh, kind of doing, saying the obvious thing that we can also define this generalization of a prox, of a prox operator that instead of having you know, a normal L2 norm squared as the thing we're sort of measuring closeness by, we just measure closeness um, by, by this other quadratic form. That's really all it's saying. All right, any questions? And, and uh, you know, a, few, a few quick points. Of, of course, the difficulty of running that proxy method depends strongly on whether or not we can solve this prox operator, which often depends, in, in, in the course, very strongly on how complex that Hessian is. So the Hessian is diagonal, for example, then you can actually solve it very efficiently, the same as a normal prox operator. Uh, but if the Hessian is, is, is dense or something like this, it can become a lot harder. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, though actually we're not going to cover the way these things are really solved in practice. So the way they're, they're often solved in practice actually was based upon a subsequent lecture. Um, I'll mention it and I'll call it out here, but um, you, we won't actually talk about how to solve the inner prox operator because in many cases actually is not that easy to solve. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, well, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> we'll keep marching on. Okay, um, this is a little more little kind of details here, um, but just like proximal gradient, uh, to get all the nice convergence properties, you do need a line search method as well with proximal, with proximal Newton methods. Um, and it uses mainly the same kind of ideas of backtracking line search that you use for normal gradient descent or for Newton's method or any other sort of thing, but with a little bit of a twist. So we know from, or I'm telling you at least, you don't know yet, but I'm telling you that that prox operator is sort of very expensive to compute, and you don't want to compute it a lot. Um, well, in normal backtracking line search, for, say for prox gradient, we repeatedly evaluate the prox operator in the steps of the backtracking line search because it's relatively cheap in those cases and you can get, you know, a, 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 a get convergence that way. Um, but the only thing I want to emphasize here is, and, and the formula is here, but what's actually important here is that the way you typically do backtracking line search for prox Newton is that you do it in a way that does not require you to solve the prox operator at each, at each backtracking step. Um, so instead of that, we actually define this, this delta here, which is the prox operators. That would be the update with a full step minus x. Of course, that's the, in the updates we make. Um, that's the update we would actually make to, to, to x. Um, then we introduce some step size t, and we repeat this until we, we repeatedly scale t by beta here until this condition is satisfied that you know x plus our update, the function value of x plus our update. Remember, f is includes both g and h, so the total function value of our update is greater than, or, or while as long as this, until you repeat it until this is less than, this plus um, our sort of first order approximation plus some scaling of the prox term as well. And really the only important thing here is that, or the main important thing here, is that this backtracking line search does not actually involve the prox operator. So we don't actually run the proximal step in our backtracking line search all we do is we just sort of have a you know, slightly different spirit of, of method that requires that we just evaluate the function again and again at the different stages of our backtracking, not its actual prox, prox map. Um, so the details are there, but if you, so if you want to implement it, just use that formula. Um, but that's, that's, the, that's the basic idea. And so we try to not spend too much time uh, on the, in backtracking, or at least rather, we don't want to spend too much time in backtracking, so we eliminate sort of the most complex part of the algorithm uh, when we're backtracking. Okay, so let's sort of summarize now a little bit. Um, so proximal gradient uh, iteratively minimizes um, this sort of just normal squared L2 norm plus the non-smooth portion. Uh, it often has a closed form for that, for that iteration. Um, that makes it fairly cheap, and it gets the convergence properties of gradient descent. Proximal Newton, on the other hand, iteratively minimizes some other quadratic form plus this non-smooth term. Um, there's almost never a closed form to that prox update, so actually doing that is, is quite complicated. Um, and the iterations are very expensive. Uh, but if you can do it, you get the convergence of Newton's methods. So you get quadratic convergence. 
Um, actually, does he? OK, let me actually, before, before going on, let me actually say sort of how this is done in practice. So um, we aren't going to cover it, but the cases where uh, proximal Newton works well, the things that I've typically seen are when you can solve this inner problem relatively, efficiency, relatively efficiently, even though you can't solve it in closed form. Um, so for example, you know, that problem, what that is, take the example of the L1 norm. That's minimizing a general quadratic with an L1 norm uh, additional penalty. Uh, that's, that's not an easy thing to solve, but we do have some pretty fast methods for solving it. And in fact, one of the fastest ones is methods like uh, coordinate descent, which I'll cover later in this course. So what people actually do is there are classes of, of, of sort of sets of functions where minimizing that problem using coordinate descent at every iteration of a Prox Newton method is actually better than running coordinate descent on the original, the original method itself. And that's because coordinate descent on, um, on a quadratic form has a specific kind of update you can make that makes it very efficient without having to constantly reevaluate the, the, the actual gradient and the Hessian itself. Um, I'm not gonna, that's actually all I'm going to say for now because you will cover coordinate descent later, and there's some later slides on, on doing that. Um, but essentially, even though there's never, there, there, there is not a closed form, uh, the high level here is there are classes of problems where it's easy to minimize that, relatively speaking, and you end up getting an algorithm that performs better than if you just try to directly minimize your, your original function. So take that for what it's worth, but um, this, we're leaving it a little bit unsaid right now because we haven't covered coordinate descent yet, um, but that ends up being the thing that's used most often for the inner prox, for the inner prox step. Um, okay, any, any questions on any of that? There's got to be some questions. Yeah. Explain again why we don't need to reevaluate the products operator in that tracking search. Um, why, like, why we don't need to, or is that like, this doesn't do it? Like, it. So, sorry, how this doesn't do it, or, or. Okay. Well, so, I mean, at a high level, this just doesn't do it, right? So, <laughs> there's no procs in the, in the backtracking line search here, right? So, what you're doing is you're forming, I mean, what's sort of going on is that you're kind of forming an approximation to the function that involves kind of these, remember, remember when uh, Ryan talked about the generalized gradient, which is kind of this function that's kind of like the procs operator? You're kind of doing um, backtracking line search on the original, on, on the composite function, plus this sort of generalized gradient-like term is kind of what you're doing. Um, and the, 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 the difference here is that, um, I guess the difference between normal, normal um, is that you have this alpha term that multiplies both your next step and your current one for just the h term here. Um, and that allows you, that basically is the generalization that allows you to, um, to, to not have to do, not have to recheck your, your sort of prox operator each time. Um, you just check the actual values of the function themselves and see if the function itself has sufficiently decreased. And it kind of works. I mean, I guess this is kind of hand wavy, but it kind of works because it's using things kind of like the generalized gradient in the, in the backtracking line search. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, um, okay, I mean, this isn't very clear. So the question was, do, do I still need to use the procs to get V? Yes, you do. You, I mean, just to be clear, you have to evaluate the procs to do this. The point is, um, the way backtracking line search is that, it, 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 backtracking line search is just a, it's like a while loop, right? It's, it's while this condition is true, I multiply T times uh, equals B, beta times T, and then I reevaluate this thing. Um, the point is, if you look for the, for the bacteria line search in the proc step, the actual evaluation here involved the prox operator, meaning that if we went, ended up doing you know, 10 different backtracking steps, we had to evaluate the prox operator 10 times. Here, we had to evaluate it once at the beginning of the iteration, and then in the actual backtracking procedure itself, we don't reevaluate it. We just evaluate that one time, and then, and then that's good. All right? So that's a big difference. If the prox operator is expensive, then doing it you know, once per backtracking step would be very, very costly, and so we avoid that with this particular line search instead of the normal uh, prox gradient line search. Did that, did that make it clarify your point up there too? Okay, yeah. 
Um, you can, I believe, you can do that, but actually it's no more efficient for the prox gradient. I and mean, I think the other one's a little bit more natural for the prox gradient. Yeah. I mean, assuming you have an order n, uh, assuming basically computing your function value is the same complexity as computing your prox operator, which it is for most normal prox operators that we have. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about convergence of um, Prox Newton. And I'm not going to, I'm going to sort of, this is going to be a sketch relative to the convergence proof we had for um, Newton's method, but it really uses a lot of the same properties. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of try to highlight one in a little bit of detail, um, but we'll, we'll kind of go from there. So the first thing we're going to, so, so, so uh, are the assumptions we're going to use here um, are similar to the Newton assumptions, actually it's also similar to the quasi-Newton assumptions, uh, for the convergence analysis at least. We're going to assume that the Hessian of the smooth part of G is uh, bounded below by everywhere by little m and bounded above everywhere by big L. Um, and the Hessian itself is Lipschitz with parameter big M. And so, of course, I mean, again, um, these terms kind of act like, uh, like strong convexity and, 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 and Lipschitz continuity on the, on the um, function itself. And then the other term is required because this term kind of bounds sort of how far from quadratic is our, is our function. The, the Lipschitz constant on the Hessian says it's kind of how far are we from quadratic. If the, if the function was quadratic, that Lipschitz parameter m would be zero. Um, and so uh, you would have instant conversions like you do with Newton's method. Um, we also are going to assume for now that we can exactly evaluate the procs. Uh, we'll get to kind of breaking that assumption a little bit because the reality is you can almost never exactly evaluate the procs. You almost always solve that one approximately. But assuming those two things, um, we have the following proof for, or following convergence proof for um, procs Newton. So what we have really, again, is, um, is quadratic convergence. So we have local, well, I should say, um, it converges globally. And locally, uh, that is for some you know, sufficiently large step, we get quadratic convergence, meaning that the difference between um, and I should say sort of you know, local quadratic convergence, meaning that the difference between successive values and the optimum uh, in two norm, so that's equal to some constant, and the constant here is just actually big M over two little m, um, times the previous difference squared. So if this is small, this thing is small squared, so it just immediately goes to zero, basically, for all intents and purposes. Um, and this means, you know, we need log log 1 over epsilon iterations to achieve precision epsilon, which is like 6 is, you know, as big as you can possibly get that thing. <laughs> so uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty fast. Um, all right, so how does this work? So there are really, like normal Newton's method, there are really three steps, three sort of elements to this proof. Um, the first two which I will just sort of mention but not show, uh, and the last one, or say what they're saying, and the last one I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail about it. So the first one, the first sort of uh, property that holds, is that um, we, uh, you can show that the backtracking line search will always terminate. It will never go on forever and sort of, I mean, cause, right, because that, that's sort of the danger here. The danger here is that this process with this line search will just go on forever, and if it goes on forever, you, I mean, or gets really, really small, maybe vanishingly small, uh, each time it gets smaller and smaller each time, then you obviously aren't going to converge, right? You can just take smaller and smaller steps and never actually reach an optimum. Um, so what the first property shows is that um, this, uh, this condition, in other words, the backtracking line search condition, will always be satisfied as long as t is less than the minimum of 1. Well, that's sort of obvious. It has to be at least 1. Um, and 2m over l, uh, l times um, 1 minus alpha, where alpha was one of the parameters of the backtracking line search. Okay. So as long as you have that condition, um, you will terminate uh, your backtracking line search 
I mean, hopefully with a bigger T than this, but at the very worst case with this amount of T, that will decrease your function by some fixed amount. Um, and so therefore, you are eventually going to, you are eventually going to you know, converge. Uh, it actually will give you linear convergence, too, um, though I won't, that's just sort of a side effect, because that's actually bounded by, um, by, by, by some constant. And so you eventually, you will actually converge, and your function will decrease by a certain amount. Um, so that, that, that's th what, what this first part shows is that you will converge to the, you will eventually converge to the, to the optimum of this problem. It will not run forever. And in fact, it only, it will get linear convergence globally. Um, the second property is that um, here's there is, is, is for large enough k, but for, for large enough, so yeah, for, so for large enough k, um, or equivalently uh, for xk close enough to the optimum, because that's what happens with large enough k, um, you will actually, backtracking line search will, will, will exit uh, with t equals 1. So you will take the full Newton step after a certain point. Right? And this is actually proved very, very similar to how you prove the same condition for Newton's method. Um, it essentially just you know, follows from the, the curvature of the function. Um, this uh, Lipschitz constant on the, actually, yeah, this Lipschitz constant on the, um, on the Hessian, and, and you get this point. Um, and the third one is that when you take a step of t equals 1, you have local quadratic, or, and, your, and k is big enough, you have local quadratic conversions. Uh, and this one I might spend a little time with. Um, so you have the fact that my next iterate is the, no the two norm of this is less than this constant times the um, two norm squared of the previous iterate. Um, this one isn't too hard to show. It's going to use the non-expansiveness of the prox operator um, uh, in, the, in the h norm uh, plus some other properties. Um, but, but basically, it goes something like this, uh, I think. So if you have x plus minus x star, the two norm of this uh, is, first of all, just going to be less than or equal to 1 over the root m times the h norm of the same thing. That just follows. That's, that's just a simple property of, of h norms, right? Because the this, this can only grow it, basically, or the, the, this is going to be bound, you know, this thing is going to be less than this thing where this thing can only, can only scale it down by 1 over root m, where m is the smallest eigenvalue of h. Um, next, you, you, you can expand these two things. So we also know this is less than or equal to 1 over root m of the prox of x minus h inverse gradient of g of x minus the prox of x star, because x star is a fixed point of the prox operator. I guess I'll write prox h here. Prox h uh, minus the prox of this thing. So that's the prox step you know, at the optimal point, which we know is the same as the optimal point there. And then h. Um, next, use the fact that the prox operator is what's called non-expansive in this h norm. I, I won't prove that, but I think that was shown for the normal prox operator before, I believe. So what, what, what that says is I can, if I have you know, the prox h applied to something evaluated in the h norm, I can remove the prox terms here. So this is also less than or equal to uh, 1 over root m times just this thing removing the prox operator. The prox will only sort of contract the difference in, the, in this h norm of x minus h inverse g of x minus x star uh, plus h inverse g of x squared um, in the h norm. Uh, and now I'm actually going to um, I'll do this. 
Yeah, now I'm going to remove this h term. So I'm actually just going to bring this in to the expression. So I will get like an h to the 1 half there. And I'm going to add one more. <laughs> this is a little, hopefully, hopefully this makes sense here. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add an h inside here uh, and get rid of it here. And that will add another 1 over root m term. So I get a total 1 over m times h of times this thing, which is h times uh, x minus x star. Uh, minus g x plus g x star in the 2 norm. Okay, that was a little tricky. W w what I did there was I basically first distributed this inside, then added another term like this, and then distributed that one inside. So I moved the h in front there, and this, of course, canceled against these things. Um, and this is now actually, you can kind of look at this and see that this is actually a, um, this is actually like a Taylor expansion of the gradient of G um, evaluated at, at, uh, at X star. So um, let's put a little bottle. So this, this thing actually is, is this is sort of the, the, the answer. This is now less than or equal to M over 2M of X minus X star. Um, but to see why this is the case, you can sort of think about um, the gradient of x star. Um, actually, I'll just say the gradient of x. Uh, this is equal to the gradient of g at x. This is equal to um, the gradient of g at x star times the Hessian of g um, at, which is at x here. Uh, times x minus x star, which is exactly what we have inside here, plus some term that depends on, uh, or some term that depends on x minus x star squared, right? Because that's sort of our Taylor expansion. We have only terms that are sort of lower order than x minus x, they're x minus x squared. Um, and if we actually want to bound this thing, so, so uh, have the, 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 the norm of this minus that, then actually this is less, this, this whole thing is less than or equal to the Lipschitz constant of this guy, which is m, uh, and this, yeah, m times x, sorry, this is squared, uh, m to x minus x star squared. So that's sort of how you, how you prove this. Um, the square here comes from the fact that this is a Taylor expansion of the gradient of x around x, um, and then you just bound it with the Lipschitz constant there. So that, that's sort of how this, how this works. And again, the important part here is that you get, um, because the remainder terms are all of the order of uh, x minus x star squared, um, you get this extra square term there. And that was, that's, that's what gives you quadratic convergence, assuming you take that step sets of one, which again, we know we take that step sets of one eventually. So uh, don't, don't, I mean, that's, this, is, this is, I think, just details. This isn't too important here, uh, other than the, co the concept of how you get it. This is a, you, can, you can prove the convergence of Newton's method in a very similar way. I think you did something very similar to the prove Newton's method's uh, convergence. Um, and basically, you, you have the same kind of proof for, uh, for prox Newton as well. Does this step all, this steps all make sense here, roughly speaking? Yeah. 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 So let me let me sort of say this again, okay. <laughs> because that one's kind of weird. So I what I did was I had some I had some term like like y in the nor in the so I had you know a term like one over square root of m of the norm of y in h right. This is equal to um, one over root m of the you know h to the one half times y in the two norm which using the same rule we applied above is less than or equal to 1 over m times h uh, 1 half times y in the h norm, which is equal to 1 over m of h y in the 2 norm. So I'm just, I was just like doing this thing twice, uh, the same, using the same minimum eigenvalue bound twice to also move from a um, square root here in the denominator to, a, to, a, or just, just to m. Uh, in the denominator. Does that make sense? Sort of overlaying this again. So, you know, I had, had this here. Um, 
I move the h to one half times this thing. I apply this thing again to add another h there, and then I move that h inside. It's just basically done that way so that these h's cancel out, and I get an h in front of x minus x star. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the, yeah. So so how did I how did I go from here to here? So this is a property of prox operators in general, which I actually won't prove. It's called the non-expansive property of prox operators. Um, I did did did, did Ryan cover that for normal prox operators, non-expansivity, uh, at all? So basically, if if you have so the the property is that if I have two two points uh, x and y, so if I have x and y, then um, if I take the prox h of x minus the prox h of y in the h norm, this is less than or equal to just x minus y in the h norm. So um, when I apply the prox operator to two terms in a inside uh, a norm like that, it will only bring them closer together. Um, this is often easiest to see actually kind of visually for like a projection. So if I have two points, like the, the projections are, are non-expansive, for example, right? So if I have two points, I'm say projecting them onto the set. If these two points are this far apart onto a convex set, then projecting them onto the set can only bring them closer together. It can never bring them farther apart. Um, and this, the same intuition holds for prox operators that taking the prox of two um, taking the prox, including this prox Newton, or this, this, this sort of scaled prox, of two different vectors, um, that can only decrease the distance between them in the prox, in, in the same norm, H. And this is called just the non-expansiveness property of the prox operators. It can say the same. I mean, of course, if they're already in, like if the two things are already inside the set, then it wouldn't change them at all. So it's less than or equal to that. But it can, it, it can never bring them farther apart. Yeah. Uh, so the first inequality on the page, uh, is that that I would only work for positive definite. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. All this is assuming H is positive definite. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to, so it's actually also to be clear, like, this is assuming that not only is it positive definite, it's actually positive definite with minimum eigenvalue M. So all of this assumes that. So you definitely need that to, to, uh, to, 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 to prove any of this. Um, if H is, if, if your Hessian is not positive definite, uh, not only does this not go through, the method does not work, right? This method does not work if you have a neg if an indefinite Hessian, or even a, e even a uh, semi-definite you know, a, a, a Hessian with zero eigenvalues. The inverse doesn't exist then, and so all, all bets are off. And in fact, for this proof, um, you actually need more than that. You really need this. Um, strong convexity, it's called, right? You need this minimum eigenvalue condition for this version of the proof. There are other versions I think Ryan might have alluded to called, called self-concordant based analysis that, that relaxes that assumption and gives it an easier type or, or a different type of assumption instead. Um, but here we're just assuming strong convexity. And so there you have strict positive definiteness of the Hessian. <coughs> yeah. Um, it's in the two norm, I believe. Uh, that's sort of how the Taylor expansion usually works, is, is, is in measure of the two-norm. Yeah? Do we need the big end over C small No, it actually should be bigger than one. Um, it almost always will be bigger than one, right? Because the, the, the um, I guess, right, sorry, it doesn't actually, not, it's, not, it's not the same as L and M, but, but no, it can be bigger than one um, by, by quite a bit. Um, the point is, this can be big, but as long as this is, small enough, this is really, this is like small squared is really small. It's going to overwhelm any constant here. So as long as this is, so, so it's sort of, it's okay if this is big. Uh, so it's not like normal, like linear convergence where this has to be less than one, otherwise it's, it's, it's vacuous. Um, here, this can be big, but as long as this is really small, this will still go to, this will still, you know, drop off. For small enough, um, for small enough uh, differences here, i.e. for big enough k, it'll, it'll fall off. Okay, so that's great. All all sounds good. <laughs> um, so the, the only thing I want to that, that I want to point out here is that um, uh, this is a practical method, um, despite 
everything I've said so far about we have to solve this prox, but I haven't told you how to do. Um, there's no closed form like there is for the, for the normal prox operator for these scaled prox maps. In fact, they involve solving something which just seems like a hard problem, like a general quadratic form plus an L1 constraint. Um, that already seems like a pretty hard problem to solve. Um, but it turns out for certain classes of problems, these really are some of the state of the art. So one, uh, uh, the most common, to be honest, the, the, one, that, the one that I see most um, are L1 regularized problems with a non-quadratic loss or a non-quadratic objective plus an L1 term uh, for sufficient sparsity. So for very sparse solutions, this ends up being one of the, one of the state of the art methods. <coughs> um, Two of these methods are called GLMnet, so that uses Prox uh, Newton for, for general L1 penalized uh, generalized linear models. Um, the inner problems are solving using coordinate descent. Uh, Quick uses Prox Newton for the, for the graphical lasso problem. Um, there actually is some fancy factorization tricks you have to do, so you have to sort of store and cache certain elements of the Hessian when you're doing your coordinate descent updates. Um, but you can do that, and, and then again uses coordinate descent for the, for the inner loop. Notice the pattern here is that all the state-of-the-art things use coordinate descent for the inner loop. It turns out for L1 regularized problems with quadratic terms, coordinate descent works incredibly well. And these are essentially exploiting that to make a fast outer algorithm um, when you don't have a quadratic term. So when you're minimizing some other function plus an L1 term. Um, in which case, just to be clear, on the original problem, coordinate descent would not work very well because you have to recompute Hessians or gradients um, each time you, you want to make an update. Uh, so, so Essentially, this is this, the, these methods for the right scales, i.e. for the proper amount of sparsity, are state of the art, and they, they, they really can be the best methods of solving some of these problems. Um, just to give a few sort of uh, <coughs> hints at that, uh, this is an example from Lasso, just, just um, logistic regression with L1, with an L1 regularization term. Um, showing here uh, the FISTA algorithm, and I guess, I think SPARSA, Sparse uh, is, oh, it's a spectral, a spectral projected gradient method, uh, again, versus proximal Newton. So you need many fewer function evaluations, and it's also um, quite a bit faster than other methods. Though this case actually isn't hugely so. There are some cases where everything else, including, including FISTA, is incredibly slow, and this thing just uh, you know, finds solutions incredibly quickly, especially for low sparsity levels. Um, the reason here why, by the way, you need, like this is, looks much better than this one, is that Prox Newton spends a lot of time not just evaluating the function itself and the function's gradient, but actually computing the, 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 the proximal map. So it, you know, it uses many fewer function evaluations, but you, know, you don't get quite as big a win on time because still solving that, prox, that proximal map takes some time. Even though it doesn't take many function evaluations, it still takes some time. Uh, and similar for different size problem. I actually think that, that the, um, this, this example before, so this quick paper, I think has some of the most compelling examples I've seen of that. Uh, if you want to look up that paper, it has cases where essentially, you know, the, the, um, you get a similar plot like this, but the um, proximal Newton is like a vertical line on the left here where it just solves it instantly and everything else takes, you know, hours or so. Uh, so, so for certain problems, this can be a really uh, compelling method. Uh, okay. So let me highlight a few uh, additions now that we can talk about. Uh, and this I'm going to go kind of fast through this because um, I do want to have time for the last thing uh, in this lecture, which is about projected Newton methods. Um, so the first thing to say, and actually this would already speed up, make the graph in the last one look a lot better. Um, the first thing to say is that with proximal Newton, we are almost always not going to actually solve that proximal map exactly. Um, unlike, you know, again, proximal gradient, where it's, it's a closed form expression, here we're solving it with some iterative method. And so it'd be really nice if we didn't have to solve it, you know, to full precision uh, every time. Especially in the early stages, you say, you know, okay, if, you know, when we're just starting out, maybe we'll get a good initial step by just solving it, you know, to some nominal accuracy, um, the, the inner prox operator and then take that step, and then maybe only as we get really close to the solution do we solve it to higher, to higher precision. So now you can, you can do this exactly. Um, so here are some plots on um, an adaptive versus sort of, you know, an exact versus a, you know, capping the maximum iterations at some, at some number. Um, and, and the important uh, plots to show here are actually, is actually these, this, these two here. 
So the, green, the, the red line is exact. It means that you um, are solving, you know, to numerical precision the prox operator. Whereas the adaptive one actually solves it um, to a stopping rule I'll show in the next slide. So basically, at earlier iterations, it stops the inner solve of the prox map sooner. Um, and the point here is that you essentially, if, if you pick the right rule, which is called this, this adaptive rule for determining when to stop your inner, you know, your inner step of the prox uh, solution, you basically get the exact same convergence in terms of the number of iterations as the, um, as the exact method, but you require much less time than it. Um, and in contrast, you have to be smart here, though, because if you just were to say, okay, I'm only going to run, say, 10 iterations of, the, of my you know, uh, pro inner proc solver, 10 coordinate descent iterations, something like that, uh, you actually no longer get quadratic convergence anymore. You get, um, it's, it works okay, but you actually are slower than, than even the exact method, and you get, um, it's no longer quadratically convergent. You can see you get linear convergence again. So you lose your nice properties of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the approach. And all I'll say about this, I just want to highlight this briefly here. Um, uh, remember, there was something similar said about Newton itself. So you could also sort of do the Newton solve only inexactly. And there was this condition that, you know, we wanted to solve the Newton such that the norm of our approximate, that's our, our quadratic approximation, was less than some um, you know, constant times the norm of the true, of, of the true gradient, uh, where, where the, the etas here go to zero eventually. Um, and proximal Newton does the same thing, but using these generalized gradients in place of the, the, the true gradient. Um, so generalized gradient, remember, was sort of the, was defined by this the normal prox operator, not, not, not the Newton prox operator, just by the normal prox operator, um, and then they, uh, they just use that and said, and there's some complicated rule for how you pick etas here, but we're not going to worry about that. It's just basically, as long as you ensure that you run to some given accuracy, uh, you are guaranteed to actually, in this case, achieve a, a superlinear rate if you follow this pattern. So similar, actually, to the like, quasi-Newton methods that, uh, or, uh, that you know, don't get Quadratic performance, they get, they get superlinear performance. If you follow this pre precise sort of um, method for picking the how exactly you want to solve the prox map, you get similar superlinear conversions. And this is sort of what it looks like. Uh, you know, it looks essentially ex exactly the same, and you know, it takes much less time. Okay. Um, the last thing I'll say about well, until I get to the, the the true last thing, <laughs> second last thing I'll say, uh, is that of course, um, you know, so back to my original sort of slide here. Uh, where did I? I want to keep these in the right order. Here we go. Um, so back to my original slide here. Uh, so far we've been talking kind of in this area here. Uh, but there are, of course, also are versions of the Prox Newton that fall into the quasi-Newton space as well. So you can do all of this same stuff uh, using an approximation to the Hessian for H in place of the true Hessian. Uh, this can have some advantages, for example, if the Hessian has, if, you're, if your approximate version of the Hessian has certain structured form, say it's you know, block sparse or if it's um, low rank or things like this that we know there is form, then actually sometimes the, prox the proximal map itself becomes much easier to solve. Um, so not only do you get the you know, added benefit of the, of the not having to compute the Hessian, the true Hessian in the first place, sometimes you actually can make your proximal map also easier to solve. Um, and and, and uh, there is some work, for example, on using you know, block diagonal Hessians that make, keeps things, you know, only small Hessians are needed, so you can, you can solve those prox maps much more efficiently and all this kind of stuff. There's, there's, there's a huge range of optimizations you can optimizations of the optimization process <laughs> that you can use here. Um, and it's also, you know, when it's, when it's actually also be helpful when it's ill-conditioned. So if your Hessian is really close to being singular, actually these things can help even though um, uh, they are, you know, they can actually make it do better sometimes than the normal prox Um Okay, any questions there uh, until I move on to the le next and last thing? Okay, so the last thing I want to say, and actually I want to spend some time on this because um, it's something that everyone tries, including myself, and I was learning all this stuff. And the thing you try, okay, so let me show you the thing you try first. So um, 
everyone tries this. We, you learn about predicted gradient descent in this course. Um, and you learn about Newton's method. And so predicted gradient descent, you take a gradient step and you project onto an allowable set. So if you have a good projection operator, a fast projection operator, you can do this efficiently. So the natural thing to say is, well, OK, I can also do a, uh, take a Newton step. Those are better. And I'll just project that. And, and you will implement this probably, and you'll try it and see if it works. And lo and behold, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything, in fact. Uh, you can see, actually, it won't do anything just by the fact that, like, um, a, 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 uh, for example, if, if I want to minimize a quadratic subject to some constraint that I can easily project onto, you can't just take the solution to the quadratic, which is what the Newton step gives you, and project that onto your set. That doesn't work. And so, of course, a predicted Newton method would not work as you would hope it would work. Um, but why is this the case? Because we've done prox Newton, that, that works. So why, doesn't, why can't you just take a Newton step, then project onto your feasible set, and hope everything works? Um, and the reason actually falls out pretty nicely from um, just analyzing the proximal Newton method. So remember, uh, when you would apply proximal Newton methods, to, or proximal methods in general, to the case where your, um, the function that you're applying the proxy to, the non-smooth function, is an indicator set, then the proximal gradient reduces just to projected gradient. Um, but trying to do the same thing with uh, proximal Newton does not give you the sort of naive projected Newton method. So let's just see that for a second. Um, so uh, remember, if, so I guess I'll just do sort of, so proximal gradient slash projected gradient. Um, so if my function h here, in all cases, is uh, the indicator of being in some uh, the indicator of being in some set C of x, um, then our prox map here, right, our prox function uh, is equal to the argmin of over z of x minus z plus h of x, which is equivalent to the argmin, uh, so this will be infinite if it's outside the set and otherwise uh, zero. Um, so that this is just equivalent to saying we're going to minimize the argmin in this set of x minus z. So in other words, the prox operator just becomes a projection operator onto our set here. When we pick our function to be the indicator of that set. It's, sort of, it's like a box on the side. Um, so therefore, you know, Proximal gradient is just naturally uh, results in the same predicted gradient method that we saw even earlier. Um, but let's think about proximal Newton. Um, what this says is that I guess I'll just write it like this. So what this says is, is that is that our you know uh, increment is the or our new step is the argmin over z in our set of the the Newton prox, or you know, the equivalent term in the prox Newton, the prox Newton uh, map, um, which equals the argument over C uh, of, uh, you know, I'll just write the second one here, our gradient uh, times C minus x plus one half C minus x transpose H C minus x. And this, of course, is not a projection onto the set C. It's something else, right? It's the minimization of a quadratic subject to the constraint of being in that set, um, which is in itself a hard problem to solve, typically, right? We, we haven't really gained anything from this. So in general, you cannot just take a Newton step, and which is this, which is, you know, uh, would be this thing here, and then project the result, because you have to do the projection under this norm h, which is a hard problem in itself to solve. Okay, so that's sort of the problem with projected Newton, is it doesn't actually, the, the thing you would think would work when you say projected Newton, which is take a Newton step and then project, does not actually work. It is not a valid algorithm. It will not actually give you a solution to a convex problem. So um, if you then Google projected Newton in frustration because you can't figure out how to get it to work, um, you will find something called projected Newton. Uh, and what that is, is that is this algorithm applied to special cases where you actually can solve this thing efficiently. Um, but even then, it's, it's not easy to do. It's actually quite difficult. Um, and it only applies to certain types of constraints C. So in particular, um, the one type of algorithm where you really can make prediction Newton work pretty reliably is on bound constrained problems. So if my constraints are of the, so, so if my problem is of the form, I want to minimize over x some function g of x, uh, 
subject to the constraints that um, I just have some simple bound constraints on x. This actually is the case where if you work it out, you can derive the equivalent of the proximal Newton step here for a constraint. So in other words, this constraint. And it ends up being actually um, uh, solvable with this, then with what they call a projected Newton method. Uh, but it's not easy. Okay? It's not sort of the simple thing. So let me just say how this works now. Um, actually, I have, I have plenty of time, so I can say this works with some, <laughs> with some, uh, some amount of time. So here's the idea. Um, what we're going to use is we're going to use what's called a, an active set method uh, to, to, solve, to solve this problem here. Um, I'll write it again up here. So I want to minimize over x, g of x, uh, subject 2, uh, l is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to u. Okay, I want to solve that problem. Um, what I'm going to do at each time is I'm going to define a set of variables that are called, the, the, that are called binding variables, uh, variables at bound, and then free variables. So the bound variables are those variables in my current, at my current value that essentially they're already at their lower bound or upper bound, and importantly, moving them, um, moving, and probably the gradient points kind of away more into the bound itself. So, so both, they're both at the bound, and kind of the gradient of that function is pushing them more into the bound. Um, so what that means is the, the bound variables at this time, k minus 1, equals a set of all i, such that, uh, you know, first of all, x, xi is, say, less than li plus epsilon. So epsilon is just some small number. And you actually just use some small number, like 10 to the negative 8 or so, when you implement this. Um, so, so the gradient is, so, so, so the value is at the lower bound. And the gradient uh, of, of this term the ith element of the gradient, in other words, the thing that we, you know, the, the, the direction we would want to go to make the thing smaller, uh, is is or the negative direction we want to go to make it smaller, of x k minus one, uh, is greater than zero, and I always look at, I have to look at these up to remember the directions as well <laughs> that you want. But basically, if the if the gradient is greater than zero, that means a step in the negative gradient would push you further in toward the lower bound. And so not only are you at the lower bound, but you kind of want to go even more into that bound. If you're at the lower bound, but the gradient is negative, you actually will make progress by stepping away from that bound. So you, you, you don't want to fix that variable. You want to take a step in that variable. Um, but if, if both you're at the lower bound and the gradient is positive, i.e. the negative gradient is pushing you into the bound, um, you, you want to fix that variable. You don't touch that variable. So obviously, this, there's the equivalent thing for the, for the other set. So this is going to be x. Um, is greater than or equal to ui minus epsilon, and the gradient of this guy is negative. So this is our bound set. This is a set that we don't want to actually touch. So we're no only going to take a Newton step actually in the remaining variables, which are conveniently called the free set. So the free set of k minus 1 is just um, 1 to n uh, minus the bound set. Okay, so it's everything else. Oops, that's a backward slash is set difference. <laughs> um, OK. So now what we're going to do is, and, and, and this is, by the way, all of this is that I'm defining here is essentially just a way of solving this inner prox operator um, when you have this particular case, but that's that's ends up being a projection, it ends up being a Newton step only in the variables that are not already at the bound. That's what the uh, prox map ends up actually, actually giving you. Um, so what we do there, then, is we form um, this image is called S, which is the inverse Hessian of the inverse of the Hessian only evaluated at those entries in the free set. So basically, I'm going to take a step in the variables in the free set. Um, but I'm only going to take the Newton step, sort of like the, the, the intelligent step, in those, um, in, those, in those free variables, right? So I'm only going to sort of look at the, be updating essentially the, the, the free variables. Um, so that would correspond to the Hessian at this guy, xk minus 1. Um, you know, only the set of them in the free set. And this whole thing 
I'm going to invert. This is going to take the rows and columns according to the, the, the free variables there. I guess Ryan just puts one. Then I'm going to take a Newton step in the free variables and project everything back into the, into the original space. Uh, so the way that we write this is that x k equals the projection onto L and U. Uh, that just means we, we, we take a step and then clip them back to the range L and U of x k minus 1. Uh, minus our step size, and we can solve this again with backtracking line search, um, times s k minus 1 and i. Um, not sure why it's this way, because th th these things won't go anywhere, because they're already at bound, and the gradient's pointing them in that way. So these, you could make this 0 too, but just to, for completeness, I guess, I'll make it this way. Um, times the gradients with respect to the free variables of um, and the gradient with respect to the bound variables. So basically, I take a gradient step, or sorry, I take a Newton step with this sort of sub-matrix of the, of the Hessian in my free variables, uh, and then I project everything back into the, the set, and I restart. And by the way, the, 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 these sets can change now, of course, right? Because two things can happen. A variable can be at bound before, and once I move the other variables, then all of a sudden the gradient points in the other direction, so it will no longer be in the, bound, in, in, in the binding set. And similarly, of course, I can have a variable that's originally in the free set that hits a bound, and the gradient stays in that direction, so then it actually um, enters, the, enters the, um, the, bound, the, 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 the bound set. Um, and the update, I mean, despite the fact that we have this i here, this is not n touching the bound variables because they cannot, they cannot move there. That'll always just, you know, maybe take a step, but then uh, be projected right back into the set immediately. Okay, so that, that's the projected Newton method. Um, and this actually works incredibly well. Um, it is... Uh, so I guess, yeah, so the paper that always will come up is, if you, if you read it, is this Persicus 1982 paper. Um, so when you, yeah, in frustration, Google printed Newton because you want to just take a Newton step and project. Uh, you'll find this paper, and it will look really complicated because it's doing this crazy thing about free variables, and, 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 and you have no idea what's going on, but, but, but now hopefully you will. Um, the paper also proves superlinear conversions, but this method actually has, gone, has gotten quite a bit of traction in recent years, um, both because it's been uh, used with quasi-Newton methods as well, so people have extended this, of course, like everything else we do, to quasi-Newton methods, um, but also it turns out that really a lot of problems that we care about do have box constraints, and just box constraints, right? So a lot of things um, like the, like the um, non-negative least squares, uh, like a lot of actual dual problems, so like uh, the L1, you know, L1 is not a, 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 a boss constrained problem, but it's dual actually is a boss constrained problem. Um, and so you can actually solve the dual of that problem and then get, recover the primal solution from that. And that actually ends up being, in a lot of cases, some of the, uh, the fast methods we have for solving these things. So like for the fused lasso, uh, and not the graphical lasso, but the fused lasso I know, um, I think still this is one of the fastest ways of solving the fused lasso. So solving the dual problem with a projected Newton method and extracting the, the primal from that is, is actually one of the fastest ways of solving the problem that we know of. So this is a really practical algorithm that has a lot of nice applications. Um, here's an example from one of these papers showing, um, I guess, this is an original image. This isn't, yeah. So the original, I, I guess it's impressive you can do anything at all with these things. They're super bad quality images. But here's the original image. Here's a blurred image that you, that you observe. And they recover this image here with denoising techniques. So I'm not sure if it's that impressive or not, but maybe it is. I mean, uh, <laughs> here's one's a little bit more impressive, maybe. This is an image. You see this is a blurred image. You probably can't even see the fact that there are two dots here. Um, that's probably largely just due to the projection. I bet they're probably there somewhere in the image. This is the original. This is the blurred image. And this is with the image recovered with a projected quasi-Newton method, um, projected quasi-Newton we're using an LBF, LBFGS type update for an approximation to the, to the Hessian. So you quickly start combining all these things together and you can form lots of new acronyms. And so PQN, LBFGS is, you know, you see a lot of these kind of things. Whereas if you just use a straight uh, LBFGS thing, it doesn't work quite as well. 
So these things really are uh, incredibly useful, and, 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 they, and they can be some of the best performing algorithms that we have and the fastest things we have for a wide variety of, of problems. Um, OK, I actually am done uh, five minutes early. So are there any questions? Not to, not to put pressure on anyone, because then you're stopping everyone else from leaving. But if you have a question, you can come in. I'll, I'll be happy to chat. <laughs>